another energy problem. This time we have a motorcyclist sliding up a hill and I've drawn a picture. I can't draw a motorcyclist so I just made it a box with an M in it for mass and it's sliding up a hill initial velocity final velocity is zero We've got some distance it's moving that's given and I always draw a free body diagram if you don't get this as your free body diagram then go back and review some of those videos on free body diagrams because uh, physics builds on itself and so we're assuming you know how to draw free body diagrams now and next uh, term when you're doing electricity and magnetism you're going to be drawing free body diagrams and figuring out electric forces and magnetic forces so get it down now alright so we're given some information here I've converted my uh, distance uh, into meters and we're missing a few things the mass and the coefficients of friction but you're smart enough to do a little test to try to figure out what the coefficients of friction are so let's take a look at that and see if uh, see if we can tell what those are you've got a block 10 kilogram block on a surface and you're pulling on it and you got a spring scale in there so you can measure the force that you're applying to the box let's draw a little free body diagram for the box the normal force the weight of the box which is just equal to mg in this case because it's on a horizontal surface and a pulling force and a friction force so if this box is not moving if you apply a zero force to the right, no force, then there's no static friction force to the left, and, and we have zero net force in the horizontal direction, the box doesn't move. If you apply a small force to the right, you get a small static friction force to the left, and the box doesn't move. And as you increase the force to the right, the static friction force keeps increasing until it hits some maximum value. And what's the maximum value for the static friction force? It's mu static times the normal force. And we know what that is because we measured it. We said the maximum static friction force was 78.5 newtons. So I'm just going to move some things around here. The m sub s is the maximum static friction force divided by the normal force and the normal force is just mg in this case so I've got 78.5 newtons over 10 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared and I get 0 0.8 for my static friction coefficient and once this thing starts moving the friction if the force we're pulling with is greater than the friction force it's going to keep accelerating to the right it's going to the speed is going to be increasing but if the friction force and the force we're pulling with are equal then we'll have no acceleration and it's going to move at constant speed and that's the situation that was given so we know that the coefficient uh, of friction multiplied by the normal force is equal to the kinetic friction force and we can solve 39.2 newtons 10 kilograms 9.8 meters per second squared I got 0 0.4 for my kinetic friction coefficient okay so we've got our friction force uh, figured out. We've got our kinetic and, and static friction coefficients. And I think we're ready to set up our, our energy problem. We know that the initial mechanical energy would be equal to the final mechanical energy if we had no external forces reaching into our system and we had no friction or air resistance, what we call non-conservative forces dissipating some of that mechanical energy and turning it into heat and other types of energy. So how do we account for those things? We add back in work done by external forces and work done by non-conservative forces. And make sure it makes sense to you which side of the equation those are on. 
if some external force is reaching into the system and adding energy to the system then we would that's positive energy we would have to put it on the left side of the equation where it is in order to end up with more final energy to keep this equality so it makes sense that it's on the left side but friction is going to slow things down it's going to leave us with less mechanical energy at the end than we started with because it's turned some of it into heat so why is it on the left side of the equation because this is a negative number and so I always write that there so I don't forget you could put it on the right side of the equation just add it but put absolute value signs around so you know you're adding a positive quantity to the right side of the equation but I'll just leave it this way for now okay what's next well we have to define our system because that's what we do in energy problems we don't want to double count anything there's our motorcyclist there's our inclined plane there's the earth and I'm gonna define everything as my system that way I have no external forces external forces drop out of the equation I don't have any so this equation becomes initial mechanical energy that's negative remember it's just kind of a little notation I have to, to remind myself okay now let's start plugging in what we know for mechanical energy we only know of three kinds right now uh, kinetic energy and we, we know we've got initial kinetic energy the things moving gravitational potential energy well let's just define our starting point as being our lowest point on the hill on the incline and so that'll be zero gravitational potential energy at the beginning and there are no springs so there we have our all of our initial energies and kinetic energy the work done by non-conservative forces that's a dot product between our friction force and our displacement and that dot product is going to give us a negative number because there's a cosine of 180 and there's a point in opposite directions and at the end we don't have any kinetic energy it's not moving when there are no springs but it's gone up in height so we've got some gravitational potential energy at the end we've got our friction force is mu times the normal force delta x and we've got a negative one maybe I should just write it out as a cosine 180 degrees and this is mgh so let's see what do we have here we've got a one-half mv initial squared we've got a minus sign we've got a mu times the normal force and what's the normal force it's not just mg let's go back and look at our free body diagram that's why I draw a free body diagram our normal force is equal to the weight in the y direction which is mg cosine 20 got a delta X I've already accounted for my negative one and I need to find my height um, it's going to be I'm just gonna write it in here and then I'll show you how I got it delta X times the sine of theta and the height comes from the fact that the block is going from there to there that's our initial position that's our final and so this distance here is H that's what we're trying to solve for and the hypotenuse of that right triangle is Delta X and we know that's theta right so sine theta is H over Delta X or H is equal to Delta X sine theta which is what I put in for H here
Okay, so we can see that every one of these terms has a mass in it. So we can cancel the mass out, which is good because it was not given to us. And we know that our V initial is going to be 2 times G delta X sine theta plus u sub k times cosine theta times g times delta x. And what do I get? I get 149. And that's v squared, remember. So v initial is the square root of 149. 12.2 meters per second. One thing I like to do is just to do a quick sanity check to make sure the number makes sense. If you're given numbers in a problem, you might as well use them and see if it makes sense. You don't want your motorcyclist to be traveling, you know, close to the speed of light or something like that. That, that doesn't make any sense. You probably made a mistake in the problem somewhere. So uh, meters per second I'm not that familiar with, but I can convert that that 12.2 meters per second is about 44 uh, kilometers per hour if you're used to uh, uh, the metric system and it's about 27 miles per hour uh, if you're used to miles per hour so that's a reasonable number actually that's not not all that fast um, for a motorcyclist to be going up a hill that's a very reasonable number so 12.2 meters per second just a quick recap uh, make sure your answer has units. We, we always uh, start out by kind of drawing a picture, get, make, getting a feel for, for what we know, what we don't know. Sometimes you can, you can fill in some of the blanks uh, with extra information that's given. That's what we did here. We went ahead and, uh, and found the coefficients of friction. And then this is an energy problem after that. Define your system so you know whether you have external forces or not. Make sure you account for the work done by friction on the correct side of the equation and don't forget the delta x there a lot of students just put in the friction force they forget that delta x and we our final answer seems to make sense